Hi, I'm Beatrice Seguin, PhD. What used to be that time of the month is now this time of the month. Welcome to our community, a curated space for everyone going through perimenopause and menopause. A place where we can find support, good laughs, great tips on products, and lots of education on health. There's beauty in aging. Whatever beautiful means to you, this time of the month will help you find it and live it. The content expressed in this time of the month is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice. The views and opinions expressed on this show are those of the speakers. Should we, since you're opening mm -hmm. that door, can of worms, the, yeah. the can mm -hmm. of worms of, of hormone, therapy. hormone yeah. therapy, let's just talk about that elephant in the room, which I yeah. think the elephant's out. It's been in the media recently. Yeah. And then we'll go back to some symptom management with non-hormonal sure. therapies. Sure. Okay. Yeah, 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 for sure. So let's um, talk about... Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. So, so far we've talked a lot about perimenopause. Um, and so we can sort of fast forward in the reproductive stages. And so now we're talking about postmenopausal hormone therapy. Yes. So the term that a lot of us are familiar with is hormone replacement therapy. And I will say we are trying to change this term to menopause hormone therapy because we are not replacing hormone levels to the physiologic levels that you were before menopause. So it's it's not the right term. And words um, matter. Words, words matter. matter. Um, it doesn't mean that you're uh, deplete of something. We're not giving you something that you lack. We're just augmenting. So um, they did a, researchers did a study, um, which was a really huge randomized control trial called the Women's Health Initiative. WHI. To, to look at what the, um, what the effect and uh, what the risks and benefits would be um, of using hormone therapy, estrogen and progesterone in women who have a uterus and estrogen in women who no longer have a uterus. And they did this study originally to see if hormone therapy could be used as a prevention strategy um, for heart disease in women who were after menopause because we thought that, I mean, researchers were onto something. They knew that there was a role of estrogen in that laying down of plaque or you know the blockages that we hear about yes. that lead to heart attacks and strokes. Um, and so they, they did this, this study. The issue with the study is that the people that they enrolled were largely, largely in number, women who were over a decade past their final menstrual period. They had lots of cardiovascular risk factors just at baseline, average age of 63, predominance of smokers, large majority hypertensive, overweight, and then they put them on hormones at that time and they found actually that there was a scary increase in the number of cardiovascular yes. events. And they also found an increase in number of breast cancers. And when this data was collected, it was published and sensationalized with no context. Correct. And so this caused the pendulum to swing in a very anti-hormone way that we are still recovering from. And you know, I go to gynecologic talks and they are labeled, you know, the recovering, resurfacing from the WHI. You know, we have been hit as a specialty and it has harmed women yes. this this sensationalized study that was taken out of context. For our viewers, that was 1998-ish? Yes, I believe yeah. so, yeah. It was in the 1990s and um, it was a large scale study. And it, you know, this was a study that caused doctors to pick up the phone and call every single one of their patients who were on hormones and say, stop them right now. Yeah. And women went off and practitioners and patients alike became deeply fearful of hormones. So fast forward, we have gone back and we've recognized that starting menopause hormone therapy when women are so many years past their final period is not a wise idea. We've recognized that with estrogen in the role of cardiovascular disease, there is a window of opportunity where if we replace, start replacing estrogen at the time when we start lacking it, at the time just before or just after menopause, that estrogen can actually be very cardioprotective and prevent the atherosclerosis, the plaque from being laid down in our arteries. However, if that process has already had a chance to happen and we then start estrogen 
10 years after menopause, it will actually exacerbate that process and form an un, make that plaque unstable, leading to increased cardiac and events. And that's hard for you know everyday mm -hmm. lay people mm -hmm. to understand those nuances. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, and I'm really just so happy that in the last year or so we mm -hmm. were hearing it on you know mm -hmm. whether it's the BBC in England, yeah. CBC Canada, yeah. and in the U.S. Even on the Super Bowl, I think last night they had a commercial for estrogen uh, menopause awareness not estrogen awareness menopause awareness apologies. oh so that's great it, it's becoming yeah it's out there thing it's yeah. out there but yeah just to summarize for a viewer north american yeah. menopause society and canadian guidelines as well and nams is it is for, international international it is what, yeah let's just re yeah What's so the, the indication indi so indications for hormone therapy um include severe menopausal symptoms, so namely hot flashes, is, is really widely recognized yeah. as a main symptom of menopause, as well as prevention of osteoporosis. And under 60? So usually we go by, we want to start this within five years, and hopefully sooner than that, of their final menstrual period. That's key. Yeah, really that's key. key in the guideline. But the part that I think some practitioners almost don't recognize is that you can start hormone therapy for menopausal symptoms before people have had their final menstrual period. Fascinating because one of this one of the reasons I'm on this couch yeah. and why we created this time of the month is because when I started this journey, I felt yeah. very alone and I did approach my primary caregiver and yeah. She is wonderful, so to be clear, it's not it's not a nefarious, mm -hmm. uh, let's just prevent everyone. It was this association, the fear, the perception, yeah. the lingering mm -hmm. um, headlines Affe of WHI. Exactly, yeah. And it, like to put it in context, like primary care providers have to stay up to date on everything. And I feel as though in my specialty, obstetrics and gynecology is so broad. I struggle to feel up to date just in my specialty, I can't imagine how primary care providers feel. And so I do not, I acknowledge that it is impossible mm -hmm. to do that. So them retaining that knowledge from the most widely published study in our specialty and, and remaining fearful of hormones, yeah, like that's not because, them. no, and that's not, if your primary care provider is is telling you that, that is not evidence that they are, you know, not up to date or, or in incompetent or anything like that. But I do think it is unfortunately still around and primary care providers, um, many of them are comfortable providing hormone therapy, um, but, but many are not. And uh, sometimes I'll see somebody just for the first initiation of hormone therapy, and then I'll send them back to primary care providers because it certainly is not something that you have to continue seeing a gynecologist for or even see a gynecologist at all for if your primary mm -hmm. care provider is comfortable. But yeah, so um, estrogen and progesterone need to be administered if you have a uterus. That's a really important take home point. If you have a uterus, the lining of the uterus is stimulated by estrogen. So you need to balance that with progesterone. Remember progesterone we make after we release an egg and we are not releasing any eggs after menopause. So we do not have progesterone unless it's given exogenously. If you do not have a uterus because you've had your uterus removed for this, that or the other, then you only need estrogen. Right. So um, that those that's really clarifies mm -hmm. hopefully a mm -hmm. lot of misconceptions, and it's too bad that our media doesn't publish positive sensational headlines. Which is yeah. we have revised, we have reviewed the data, yeah. we have segmented yeah. the data now, and yeah. here's the. So I'm hoping that through these conversations, we yeah. create awareness for everyone, and I think. Yeah, that would be great. Somebody benefits. Yeah, that would be great. So, what about then, despite? You know, it is an option. Yeah. And not everyone will be comfortable. Right. We have agency. Yeah. Um, over our care right. as individuals. Yes. So if you have a patient who comes to you and says, Dr. Green, I'm, it sounds like there could be a lot of benefits. I just, I mm -hmm. don't want to go there. What yeah. are some options? And yeah, there are a symptom. a lot of non-hormonal options for hot flashes. Um, I'll start with hot flashes and you yeah. can ask me what other symptoms that you might be more interested in. Um, so certainly there are um, antihypertensive, so 
blood pressure medicines. Um, so clonidine is one that's typically used. Um, and there's some evidence for that um, in reducing the severity of hot flashes. Um, there's also the drug group serotonin, um, SNRIs and SSRIs. Um, and so these are drugs that we may recognize as anti-anxiety and antidepressants. Remembering that our thermoregulation center is in our brain. Yep. And so I like to just really clarify with women that I am not giving you this medicine because I think this is in your head, but it actually is inside your brain, um, <laughs> the symptom. So um, that's why neurotransmitter uh, Altering, al yeah, altering medicines can be effective. So venlafaxine and desvenlafaxine are medicines that are used, as well as lots of other um, SSRI medicines that uh, are around, really accessible, and ones that primary care providers are really comfortable prescribing. Mm -hmm. um, I want to just clarify that there are some natural therapies that have been uh, felt to help with hot flashes, but in fact there. Are is no scientific evidence. There's a sci there's evidence that they don't work. And so those are soy. So you go right. out and eat your weight in sweet potatoes. You probably won't notice a difference in your hot flashes. And if you do, placebo effect is a powerful thing and great for you. Um, but definitely, um, if you don't notice, then it's not all in your head. It's that they aren't actually effective. Black cohosh is another one that women commonly go to. Um, no effect uh, on hot, hot flashes when, we, when it's been studied objectively. Um, and we already talked about cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay. Is there another? Yeah, no, other symptoms, uh, I mean, the anxiety. We, right. Anxiety. Yeah. Anxiety. Um, so de definitely we see a change in... Um, we, we see a change in, in mental wellness in perimenopause, yes. um, significant changes. So we see increasing um, rates of depression, and this could be worsening of pre-existing depression or new onset, as well as anxiety. Um, I think that those are symptoms that we need to focus on um, in and of themselves and just acknowledge that perimenopause has an effect. I won't go as far as saying that hormone therapy is a treatment in and of itself for those things. But when I see patients with mood or anxiety disturbance, sleep disturbance, the brain fog yeah. that you and I have talked about, um, so that's just a perception of uh, cognitive dysfunction. Um, it's not, those in and of themselves are not indications for hormone therapy. But oftentimes women will experience also hot flashes. And so, I will say I'll bend the rules a little bit and I will treat women with hot flashes and those other symptoms. And I have heard back that they feel as though there's an improvement in those other symptoms. However, we lack the data at this yeah. point to recommend hormone therapy just solely to treat those symptoms. Are there studies in the works? Uh, I often, one of my favorite pastimes is looking at just how- Clinical uh, trials. Clinical trials. <laughs> Uh, women are underrepresented. Women's right. health research and development yeah, you're and right. studies for all sorts of issues. But yeah, uh, are there? Do you, are you aware of? Uh, I'm not, but I also want to be open with our audience that I am a community general ob um, and so I don't consider myself a menopause expert among my specialty. And so um, I, I like to hope that there are ongoing research. I have a lot of close colleagues who are menopause subspecialists. One of them in particular um, has a, a, a huge interest in mental health. And so uh, I like to think that these studies are, are in the works. I just am unaware of any newly and, published data. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you for, for that disclosure. <laughs> I think it's just so important that, again, yeah. awareness, but also we can demand more. We yeah. should demand more of the studies yes. uh, in women's health. So let's hope that we find evidence to... And you're right yeah. that gynecology is a, is a poorly paid gig in the sense that... Um, our Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada, so the SOGC, which is our national society for ob um, they do get a lot of um, research funding, and a lot of it will be geared towards the obstetric side. So it is a lot easier to get funds for uh, maternal, fetal, perinatal research than it is for gynecology. So, um, you know, our 
I put myself in this category, but aging women, like we are really forgotten in this. So uh, I feel as though there's a ton of money that goes into breast cancer research, um, but other health issues that commonly affect women, such as menopause, it's it's uh, not, it's very underrepresented, you're right. Well, let's hope that that changes with yeah. our conversations and yeah. um, that we can ask of our society to do better by yeah. aging women. One thing I want to go back to yes. is that we never talked about the risks that were published from the WHI, so let's I feel like there. I should go back yeah, there, go okay? There. Um, uh, so, so with the WHI, uh, they, the sensationalized headlines were that estrogen and progesterone, as well as estrogen alone, caused an increase in uh, cardiac events, um, an increased number of breast cancers. What unfortunately wasn't uh, as publicized was the tremendous decrease in hot flashes, as well as a decrease in uh, osteoporotic fractures. And if you do look at women who have a hip fracture after menopause, there is an increased risk of death in the uh, following that hip fracture. So that is an outcome that is really important. So they went back and they looked at that study uh, with more scrutiny and they did subgroup analyses and they said, what if we just look at the women who should have been put on hormones? Right. Women who are aged 50 to 59. And they found that when you just looked at that, um, that group of women, that there was a small but increased risk of cardiac events in the estrogen and progesterone group, um, less than 10 in 10,000 women per year. And this was only over um, five years of use. Um, breast cancer, there were six more breast cancers per 10,000 women, again, only after five years of use. Um, and they found uh, a almost neutral stroke risk um, in the estrogen progesterone group. Uh, in the estrogen alone group, they found a neutral breast cancer risk. So that was really interesting in that women who don't need progesterone who have had a hysterectomy um, are not are likely not putting themselves at an increased risk of breast cancer uh, in the absence of progesterone. So um, those are just important risks for us to hone in on because it's hard to look at those population statistics and apply them to the individual. Yes. I often say to women that that breast cancer risk of you know six or eight more breast cancers per 10,000 women per year, what does that even mean? Um, that's comparable to being a little bit beyond above your ideal body mass, which many of us are, that's comparable to drinking beyond low risk which drinking. Which many of us do. Right. Um, and, uh, and other uh, risk factors that we don't really weigh as heavily, as heavily, but, but this is, here's an intervention that actually could really significantly improve your quality of life and your productivity. Um, one that I think may lend itself far more benefits than that extra few glasses of wine per week. Um, and, and so I, I really encourage people to, to sort of critically, critically appraise that data and put it in context for context themselves. Context is key. Context and then your own risk benefit mm -hmm. analysis in yeah. partnership with your care provider. Yeah. Yeah. That's really important. The WHI trial also used, um, oral estrogen, uh, so they used oral conjugated equine estrogens, um, which we would call, the brand name of that is Premarin. Um, and they used uh, um, oral Provera, which is medroxy uh, progesterone. Um, and that is thought to be a more um, breast activating progesterone than the micronized progesterone that we opt to prescribe as first line now. So they used two different ingredients than I would commonly prescribe now. And so there is an argument to, is there even that much of a risk? Because we know that micronized progesterone is less active at the breast compared to MPA. That's, thank you for those mm -hmm. additional clarifications. Yeah. Those are the things that we don't go deep right. in conversations. And that's certainly uh, a lot more in depth than any TikTok or Instagram little right. video could do. So thank you for sharing right. that with our viewers. And obviously there's great resources out there. Yeah. Um, so why don't we talk about some of right. uh, good resources for our viewers. You, We mentioned, I think, already North American Menopause Society. Yep, NAMS is fantastic. There's some patient inf information there. Um, there's also Sigma, S-I-G-M-A is Canadian. Yeah, Canadian Menopause Society. That's right. Yeah. And uh, they have, for 
care providers just open access um, like notebooks. They just have uh, basically here's a recipe book for hormone therapy that can be really, really effective. And that may be something just to uh, point your care provider to. Yeah. Um, there's also some menopause information available through the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada. So if you go to SOGC.org, there are lots, there's lots of patient information through that platform also. Amazing. And um, recently, a new foundation was launched, Menopause Foundation Canada, by wow. two women. So lots of resources. That's amazing. Um, and they're geared towards both the provider and uh, women. So it's nice. Okay. Uh, that's, yeah. that's great. So we're going to switch things up a little bit okay. because that's a lot of heavy medical I topic. know. Thank you. Because if we don't understand, how can we make informed decisions? And right. That's the goal yeah. here. Yeah. Um, or play this or that. This or ready? that. Okay. This or that. All right. Um, we just talked about alcohol, but Negroni or Martini? <laughs> Negroni. <laughs> All right. Um, Any day of the week. Pumps or wedges? Pumps. Sorry. City or countryside? Countryside. And uh, ocean or mountains? Ooh, it's so tough. I'm going to go mountains. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fabulous. Dr. Green, if there's only a couple of takeaways from today's yes. episode, what would right. they be? Okay. My takeaways would be, number one, you do not have to suffer with terrible periods. There are so many easy ways of making them better, and you shouldn't have to deal with horrendous periods that rule your life, whether they're happening in your 30s or they're happening in your 40s or they're happening in your 50s. Lots we can do. That's safe and effective. Number two, perimenopausal symptoms are real. They're not in your head. They are expected physiologically, but they're not normal in the sense that you have to just accept them without therapy. Lots of things that we can do for them that are safe and effective and as part of that, don't be afraid of hormones. Hormones are our friends. Number three, if you are experiencing menopausal symptoms, you believe your last menstrual period is in your past, then talk to your doctor about whether you would benefit from being on hormone therapy because now is the time to start it, not five years down the road. And... I was telling you when we were talking off camera that the women who come and see me in their 50s who are still having periods and are experiencing later than average menopause, average age of menopause is 51 and a half, we never we talked about that, that um, are probably the women who are healthiest and look the best. So I say to them, look at your friends who are 52 and who are postmenopausal and look at you. Do you feel like you look like you're younger than them? And they say, you know, yeah, I do. And I say, that's because you still have hormones. Hormones are good for us. So giving back a little bit of hormone that you are starting to lack on your own is a good thing, as long as it's done under a physician's guidance and, um, and is done at the right time. So um, hormone therapy, it's safe. Don't be afraid of it. And nothing is a tattoo. You can try something and then stop if you don't like it. So... Love it. Thank Give you. Give it a try. Dr. Jessica Green, it's been such a pleasure talking to you today. And one of the things we want to do in addition yeah. to learn mm -hmm. about our bodies, our health, our menopause, yeah. is change the narrative right. that mm -hmm. menopause means we're over. It's 40% of our life. Mm -hmm. There's beauty and power in aging. Yeah. So Dr. Green, what makes you feel beautiful? I feel my most beautiful after I have done a killer workout and I get out of the shower and I look at myself in the mirror and I just think like, look what my body can do. My body can get through everything it's gotten through, have three healthy, beautiful children and still like slay it on the Peloton. And uh, that is without makeup or clothes on when I feel my most beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Certainly your energy is beautiful. And, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I really appreciate it. Sometimes I'm going to talk about products and services or books that I love, but I'm also going to share with you innovation for women by women. Today, I'm going to talk about something that has barely changed in over 150 years until a woman came around. And her name is Fatih Khosrow, CEO of Seek 
health. Before I get into the medical device that she has created for women, I want to bring you up to speed and I'm sure that we've all seen this and we've all experienced this antiquated 19th century torture device. It's cold, it's clunky, many of us get stressed when we have an exam. Some of us even avoid gynecological exams, which is not right because they are important for us. There have been attempts at improving this design with single-use plastic ones, which, let's face it, not good for our planet and not necessarily designed in any way that's gonna improve the user experience until a woman took charge of the situation and said, wait a minute, this is not right. And here you go, the Nella Speculum. When I saw the Nella Speculum at the NAMS conference, my mind was blown and I texted all my girlfriends about it. Here are the things that are cool about it. It is very narrow, just as narrow as the size of a tampon. It is temperature neutral, so comfortable. And for the clinician, it has these side walls that open in line with our anatomy and allow the clinician to see what they need to see. So what this tells me is that we do not have to accept the status quo. We can demand better. And while this is not something that's directly sold to consumers, it directly impacts us, the recipients of such a medical device. Just a disclosure, this is not approved in Canada. It is approved by the FDA in the United States. So this has launched in the US, but I just want you to know that you can go and ask for better. Just question why things are the way they are. Something so simple yet so revolutionary. Innovation for women by a woman. <laughs>